But my question is uh, pertaining to the ICO cloud sale. Uh, we are seeing the rise of uh, many ICOs this year, and there are also upcoming some many more ICOs. Uh, what is your take on about ICO? Do you recommend us to consider acquiring ICOs? If yes, what do you actually look for in deciding to buy those ICOs? Excellent, great question. Um, so how many people here have heard of ICOs, initial coin offerings? Okay, what these are, are the ability to raise money for startup functions, for companies that are trying to raise capital in order to build applications. Traditional means of raising capital, organic, angel investors, venture capital, bank loans, daddy's credit card, mommy's credit card, you know, all of those various systems. I've, I've used some of those, including parents' credit card, uh, to raise money for my businesses. You know, those are fairly limited. And once you start getting into larger amounts, it gets more, more and more difficult because you get restricted by a lot of rules. So if you want to raise money by venture capital, it has to be usually you're limited to which countries you can go to. Venture capital is mostly in the west coast of the United States. There aren't that many of those around. So what ICOs did is they gave uh, companies the opportunity to instead offer a digital coin for someone to buy, and that then gives them something in return. Maybe it gives them access to an application, maybe it gives them a discount on the future use, maybe um, it gives them dividends or returns on investment or whatever. Um, and the idea being that now you can open up these investments to everyone in the world. Anybody who has a digital currency can take that digital currency, use it to buy one of these digital coins, fund this new company, this new venture, and then if this company is successful, participate somehow in the success, and if it's not successful, lose all their money. What do I look for in an investment? The exact same things that I look for in an investment in any other realm. I'm looking for a product. I'm looking for an established track record in business, or at least a well-running, robust prototype with some early users. I'm looking at an addressable market. Does this application they're proposing to build have actual uses out there? I'm looking very importantly at timing. As an investor, I look at things and I say, okay, yes, one day what you're thinking of doing would be successful, but before that day happens, more people have to have digital currencies, or more people have to have smartphones, or other things need to happen, so it's not yet the right time. Great idea, wrong time. So you need a market, you need an idea, it has to be the right time, you have to have a team, that team has to work well together and be focused on execution. And all of these things have to come together for that company to be successful. And then they have a 10% chance of surviving the first five years. That's the truth of startups. If you have a real market, a real product, a great team, a plan, and some funding, about 10% chance you're going to make it through five years as a startup. 90% you're going to fail. That's the real world. So now we see these ICOs. Do they have an app? Not really, but they have a white paper. Do they have a plan? Kind of not sure. Is the timing right? Usually not. Do they have a team? Three dudes, never done a business before, kind of got together, started an ICO. Um, let's give them a hundred million dollars. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, I haven't invested in any of the current ICOs. I haven't invested in any of the current ICOs, unless you consider Bitcoin and Ethereum itself. Um, and those I did after I read the white paper, after I downloaded the software, run the software, looked at the code, understood the problem, see what they were solving, looked at the team, I said, yeah, this could work. I'm still expecting that I might lose both of those investments. <laughs> But I haven't invested in the ICOs, and the reason I haven't invested in the ICOs is because I haven't seen that particular combination. And if I do, I might. Um, although because I'm an American, they'll probably not allow me to 
in order to protect themselves from the wrath of the SEC. Um, here's the thing. You've got to make this fundamental distinction. The idea of ICOs is radical, disruptive, revolutionary, will have an enormous impact, and it will eventually become a multi-hundred billion dollar market that will allow companies around the world to fundraise for incredible projects and create many giant successful companies. It is revolutionizing venture capital and early stage investments, and it will completely transform those two industries. Any of the current ICOs actually doing that? No, not really. <laughs> Keep those two ideas separate. There's, there's nothing wrong with the idea of ICOs. The, the idea of ICOs is solid, not quite yet right on timing. I think it's going to take a few years before we see mature models come out of that. And 99.9% .9 of all of the ICOs right now will fail. Maybe one or two will succeed. If you like playing those kinds of numbers, good luck to you. That's above my risk tolerance. But being an investor, you have to know your own risk tolerance, right? Maybe you want to put five dollars into a hundred ICOs for a five hundred dollar total investment, assuming that four hundred and ninety-nine will fail, but that one will turn your five dollars into a lot more. I wouldn't take that bet. <laughs> I wouldn't take that bet. Do you have casinos in Malaysia? <laughs> Blackjack is a much more fair game. <laughs> um, so I, I really wouldn't. Um, but that doesn't mean that nobody should. Most of them are scams. You need to be very careful. Uh, many of them are absolutely blatant Ponzi's, and that applies for many of the uh, blockchains and many of the investment opportunities. Southeast Asia is absolutely full of. People pushing pyramid schemes and Ponzi's. You have to be very careful. As you may have noticed, I have not suggested to anyone to go invest in Bitcoin, because I don't think that's a good idea, if you don't understand it. <laughs> Learn about the technology, experience it, get an education in it. Um, yes, this is not an investment plan. No. I've watched with a small group of other investors with a lot of enthusiasm over the last couple of months of this ICO crazy we talked about. Yes. As with probably the other 25% of people in the room who put their hand up at the time, we'll lose 90% of what we put into it. Now, at the same time... 99.9 .9 is what I said, but okay. No. You're an optimist. <laughs> Hopefully it's a slightly better part of the, uh, the investment community. No, but my, my point is, most of this community doesn't have any kind of financial education. Yes. Most of the people who are putting money in, often referred to as Mrs. Wang Tabi, are coming in and, and they just see this craze going and they're, they're pumping money into it. Yes. Now, in the current financial system as we have it, uh, people are educated to go into that system. They then get regulatory rights to invest their money in that system. Yes. And, and by that level of regulation uh -huh. imposed upon they are protected as, as people. Uh, they are told they are protected. Incorrectly putting money into the system and losing, maybe, mm -hmm. as you said earlier, their children's wealth. Yes. So, in the current system as it is, how do you propose, without some kind of regulatory governance, to protect the individual investor from putting money into an ICO, which realistically, if you, if you do crunch the numbers, are raising five to six times their actual valuation? Yes. And, and how do you protect those people who don't know how to value them? So this is a really important question, and, and the underlying problem is that in the regulated system, investors are not protected. They're excluded in many cases, but even the ones who are not excluded are not protected. They're given the illusion of protection. So when all three of the rating and regulatory agencies took the absolute pile of shit that was coming out of AIG, credit default swaps and CDO, which combines a pile of junk bonds into a two or three AAA rated, and they stamped that AAA, and they sold that to investors, and those investors lost a million homes to foreclosures and almost a trillion dollars 
off their savings. Right after that, thousands of those regulators and financial advisors went to jail. And the system protected consumers, right? No. Not a single one of them went to jail. And you give, give money. Nothing changed. None of the rules, none of the education, none of the investment plans, nothing happened. The investors weren't protected. No, wait. One went to jail, Bernie Madoff, because he made the biggest mistake of all. He stole from rich people. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. But the middle class in America, the million homeowners who got foreclosed illegally, fuck them. That's what happened. And now we're looking at it ten years later, and absolutely nothing has changed. You don't protect investors by giving the power to someone else to decide whether they can be investors and what they should be investing in. Because when you do that, it doesn't protect the investors. But it does give enormous power to that one agency, one institution, to create the illusion of safety, and then take all of the sheep to the slaughter in one big disaster. Which, by the way, ten years later, we're now overdue for. It's coming again, and nothing has changed except for the fact that now it's in the automobile loans, student loans, real estate, bond market, and equities simultaneously, and it's four trillion dollars larger, and there's no room in any central bank to stop it. Oops. So the idea that consumers or investors were protected is a myth. It's an illusion. When things go bad at a systemic risk, no one gets bailed out. And the reason no one gets bailed out is because there isn't enough money in the world to bail people out. If you tell them, don't worry, this has the stamp of approval, what do people do? They don't worry. They don't ask questions. They fail to educate themselves. So you can do two things. You can either protect investors, or you can educate investors. And the only way to educate investors is to stop protecting investors. Because the protection is denying the education. And guess what the best education is? Losing money. <laughs> so the reason investors are sophisticated in the United States, more so than they are here, is not because they're protected better. It's because they have invested, made poor choices, lost money, learned, invested better, made poor choices, lost money, learned a bit more, repeat, 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 until they become sophisticated investors. Now, the trick is to educate them first in the most basic form of education, which is do not invest too much too fast, so that then they can survive the first lesson, the first loss, enough for them to take that and get to the second loss and the third loss. So by the fifth one, maybe they make a gain. That's how markets work. The illusion of safety. Failure is not an option. We can all win. There is no risk. It's all upside. This is a guaranteed investment. All of those words are lies. And any time you hear them, take your money and run away. The best way you can educate investors is to allow them to make mistakes and not pretend that you can pick winners and losers or protect them from making educated decisions about risk. We've created this environment where we tell people, don't worry, these experts have done all the work for you. But guess what happens when it all collapses? They're not going to jail. You're not getting your money back, and you learned nothing. So yes, people are going to lose money at ICOs. I hope they've learned lesson number one: don't invest too much, and that way they can learn. Two years from now, when there's another round of ICOs, they'll go, "Oh, what do you have? A white paper and no team." and no investment or startup experience, and you haven't yet hired any developers, and you have three slides in your presentation. Mm, no. 
Yeah, that, how do you learn that? You learn that because the first three things you invested in blew up in your face, and you made no money. So, um, this is a fundamental problem we have, which we've created this illusion of safety. And the illusion of safety itself is toxic, because it prevents people from learning. Every parent in this room knows that. How do you teach the child not to touch the stove? <laughs> You let them touch the stove. Hopefully, when it's not scorching hot, just once, and they learn really fast, <laughs> right? Because there's nothing you can say that will express the level of ouch that happens until they really feel it. Lessons in life are only learned one way: by making mistakes. And if you try to prevent investors from making mistakes, they don't learn. And then the person responsible for preventing the mistakes gains all this power, and then they abuse it, and then they get burned.